Hey everybody, we're back. The writing was so flowery and and uh, poetic, and and the the level of violence. I was genuinely shocked reading the Iliad. Just the the sheer level of gore was over the top. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea what I was in for. I had no clue that it was that full on entrails flying, brains flying, blood fl it was oh my god it was good. It was just a blood soaked romp. And you know the other thing too that I was just I it completely blew me away was how epic everything felt everything in the iliad just felt grand it felt godlike i felt like they're okay so there's the gods but then there's the mortals but these mortals were living as if they were gods it was just it was it was crazy man i'm getting like goosebumpy thinking about it. It was the most like glorious thing, like epic in the true sense of the word. It just, it blew my mind. And to think about how old it is, thousands of years old. And it's just this, it's so heavy. It's so just meaty, literal human meat everywhere. <laughs> it's so good. I, I really regret having I, I wish I would have read this years ago, but then again, I don't think that I was maybe mature enough for it. I don't think that I was really uh, there yet, I guess, too. And this is another thing, too. I think that at some, at certain points in your life, you're ready for, for certain things. And as a kid, you're handed this material, like, say, uh, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Let's say something like that. You know, you might be asked to read that in high school if you go to a high school where they still you know where, where you read these book things um you know you might be asked to read that in high school or something but you're not at the age where you can really grasp all of the larger themes that are going on and and that's the thing and so a lot of people they they end up not developing this love of some material just because when they were introduced to this stuff it didn't really hook them in and uh you know you might not be ready for certain things until you're older because the themes that are in there you only will understand after you've lived a little bit and you're kind of mature enough to get it it's just this idea that people don't read blows my mind i i, I don't understand it i don't know how you can function i don't know how you can live without um yeah, it's just, it's like living in a monochromatic world. I, I, I just don't get it. Now, I don't speak ancient Greek, unlike all of you guys. I don't speak ancient Greek. So, what I was reading was this here. I was reading the Penguin Classics Iliad by Homer, obviously, translated by Robert... And I'm not going to say that last name because YouTube might think I'm saying something else, so then I'm going to be in trouble. And already, something's up with my YouTube channel. It's kind of weird. People aren't getting my videos. I'm not even getting my own videos. So do me a favor and hit the little bell thing for notification. I know everybody does this or everybody says it and it gets kind of annoying, but please do. It really does make a difference because, I don't know, YouTube is kind of a little wacky right now. So back to Robert F's Homer. Let's read the opening page. Rage, goddess. Sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles, murderous doomed that cost the Achaeans countless losses. Hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighters' souls, but made their bodies carrion, feasts for the dogs and birds. And the will of Zeus was moving towards its end, begin muse when the first two broke and clashed, Agamemnon, lord of men and brilliant Achilles. So that was the Penguin Classics Robert translation from 1996, right? Not bad. It's functional. It's good. It's all right. But it just wasn't really hitting me, I don't think, the way, the way that it, it should have. It's just, it's a little dry, I guess. And uh, it, just, it felt a little bit like work. And that's just not what you want when reading this kind of stuff, you know? Let's go back 300 years and let's read a translation of the Iliad by Alexander Pope. This is going back to 1743. Now let's read that and let's just see how it compares. Okay, here we go. Achilles' wrath to Greece, the direful spring of woes unnumbered heavenly goddess sing. That wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign the souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain, whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry's vultures tore. Since great Achilles in a tree strove, such was the sovereign doom and such the will of Jove. 
Declare, O muse, in what ill-fated hour sprung the fierce strife from what offended power. Latona's son, a dire contagion spread and heaped the camp with mountains of the dead. To me, that's completely night and day. It might just be to me. I don't know. Maybe you would enjoy the previous one, but I really loved the Alexander Pope version of that. That, to me, is just a much juicier, more beautiful uh, cover of that material. And this is the thing. I think that like uh, translations are almost like bands covering songs. You know, you've got like uh, Depeche Mode. You know, and it, you have, like say Homer's basically uh, the Iliad's Depeche Mode, right? Or it's some song by Depeche Mode, and it's being covered by Bats for Lashes and Ramstein and Johnny Cash, and there's all these different ways that you can cover the material, right, with a, a different sort of performance or spin or voice to that work, and that's kind of the way I see translations. And for me, the Alexander Pope version of it is is much more interesting than the uh, Robert one you know but that's just me for you it might be totally different let me know in the comments below what you think maybe you think that the other one is better it, it's really like it's a bit of apples and oranges going on but there is a difference and i think when you're looking at classical material like this it's stuff that has been translated what you should do is you should really go and dig around do a little bit of research and see what version speaks to you. Find the version that you would enjoy reading. So next up, Don Quixote. Let's go to Don Quixote and we'll go to the 1755 translation by Tobias Smollett. And let's give the opening page a read and see how it compares. In a certain corner of La Mancha, the name of which I do not choose to remember, there lately lived one of those country gentlemen who adorn their halls with a rusty lance and worm-eaten target, and ride forth on the skeleton of a horse to course with a sort of starved greyhound. Three-fourths of his income were scarce, scarce sufficient to afford a dish of hodgepodge, in which the mutton bore no proportion to the beef, for dinner a plate of Selma Gundy, commonly at supper, gripes and grumblings, on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and the addition of a pigeon, or some such thing, on the Lord's Day. The remaining part of his revenue was consumed in the purchase of a fine black suit, the vel with velvet breeches and slippers of the same for holy days, and a coat of homespun, which he wore in honor of his country during the rest of the week. He maintained a female housekeeper turned 40, a niece of about that half that age, and a trusty young fellow, fit for field and market, who could turn his hand to anything either to saddle the horse or handle the how. Our squire, who boarded upon fifty, was a, uh, was of a tough constitution, extremely meager and hard-featured, an early riser, and in point of exercise, another Nimrod. He is said to have gone by the name of Quixada or Quesada. Anyway, da, 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 da. now we're going to switch to the John Ormsby 18, 1885 I think. <laughs> John Ormsby, 1885, Don Quixote, here we go, let's check this out. Same thing, first page, let's give it a read. In a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived not long since one of these gentlemen that kept a lance in the lance rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing. An olla of rather more beef than mutton, a salad in most nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made with three quarters of his income. The rest of it went on a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays, while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past 40, a niece under 20, and a lad for the field and marketplace, who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the bill hook. The age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on 50. He was of a hardy habit, spare, gaunt featured, a very early riser, and a great sportsman. There you go. And so with Don Quixote, there's a, a million, this is just two, there's so many out there. You could go 
there's a lot of different versions of Don Quixote. And again, it's like a cover. It's like covering a song, you know? You've got different bands that will cover that song differently. And pick your flavor, you know? It's it's still the material, but it's going to be told in a different way. And to me, it makes a big difference because there's how the stories... There's what the, what the plot is, you know, the, the plot points and all that stuff. But I'm an art guy, so I'm also really interested in how something is told. You know, that to me is equally as important. The way it's told, well, maybe even more, you know, each to their own. But it's extremely important how it's being told. And that's where the difference comes in. And for me, when I read that Alexander Pope version of Homer, it just, it blew my mind. Every page... It was staggering to me that you've got this monumental work that's just line after line after line of just incredible poetry. It, it just, it, it rocked my world. Now, if you have read Homer and uh, Virgil, like the a &E, then I highly recommend you read Ilium and Olympus by Dan Simmons. Excellent stuff. Excellent, excellent books. His Hyperion saga was about the Canterbury Tales. It was sort of a sci-fi twist on that. And Ilium and Olympus are twists on Homer, you know. So very different thing, but man, it's so good. Dan Simmons is excellent. Also, please keep in mind too that my reading of that is probably not going to sell you on the material. <laughs> so yeah, I, I need a, a, a suave British accent or something like that. I've got this awful Canadian thing going on. It's not, it's, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I know, I know, I know. So also too, the language itself, the lingo, the good chance it's you're, a lot of those words you're like, what, what the hell? What, what even is that? I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. And there you go. That's why, you know, you find a version, a more contemporary version that is sort of speaking in a more plain type of language. Although, you know, it is good to, uh, you know, bend your brain a little bit and, and just consider uh, an, an older version that is a little more difficult, you know, make some notes, you know, maybe it's like, oh, what, what is... What are these weird words that they're using, you know? And then just look it up, make a little note. It's fine to cross-reference as you're reading this stuff. Totally cool, you know, whatever works. Don't try and feel smart. Nothing's worse than people who think they're smart. There we are. We have reached the end of the video. Thank you for watching. Thanks for spending a bit of time with me today. If it's your first time here, why don't you uh, subscribe and 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 in introduce yourself in the comment section below. <laughs> so thanks everybody for coming and, and stopping by. I hope everybody had a good new year and all that kind of stuff. I haven't put out a video in a while. I've been really, really, really busy drawing like crazy, working on some comic stuff. Uh, I really have to uh, get a lot of stuff done. Thanks everybody for coming by and stay tuned for the next one. All right. But Enomas received the Cretan stroke, the forceful spear, his hollow corslet broke. It ripped his belly with a ghastly wound and rolled the smoking entrails onto the ground. Stretched on the plain, he sobs away his breath and furious grasps the bloody dust in death. Oh, oh, oh.